Hello there. Well, here we are again. And today I want to talk a little bit first about Memorial Day. Memorial Day is an American holiday observed on the last Monday of May, honoring the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. It was originally known as uh, Decoration Day, and it became an official federal holiday in 1971. Now, one of the very first known observances took place way back on May 1st, 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina. It was at the end of the Civil War. A group of freed slaves, men, women, and children had buried the bodies of Union soldiers after Confederate soldiers left Charleston. On May 1st, people gathered for a parade in the fallen soldiers' honor, singing hymns and placing flowers at the fighters' graves. They wanted to honor them because they had come and were part of God's plan in freeing these people from slavery. And so when someone does something for us, many times we memorialize them. Uh, and of course, nowadays, at least in my family, down through long as I've been able to remember as a child, it wasn't just soldiers. On Memorial Day, we went and put flowers at our granddad's grave and people that had done things for us. Now, today we're going to uh, talk about, in the Old Testament, uh, a memorial, a very important memorial. And um, we're going to read scripture. Uh, we're going to go to Joshua, which is in the Old Testament. And Joshua, of course, is a history book. Now, those of you that saw Prince of Egypt, you know at the end Moses had to turn everything over to, to uh, Joshua because God would let Moses lead the people into the promised land. And I'm going to start in the third chapter of Joshua. And it says in verse 5, Joshua told the people, Concentrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's water, go and stand in the river. And so they did. And what happened was when they took the ark into the river, the strange thing was that it wasn't just uh, in a river. In verse 13, it says, As soon as the priest who carried the ark of the covenant, the Lord of the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Now, it wasn't just that they were getting into the river. This was the time that it was flood stage of the river. The river was flowing and it was very deep. But it said that in verse uh, 16, uh, actually I'm going to go back to 15. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the sea of Arabeth, the salt sea was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Now the priest stood, they carried the ark in the, on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. And I'm going to just not read scripture verbatim here. I'm just going to actually just tell you the story from here, children. Now, when everybody had crossed over, uh, he has 12 men, one from each of the tribes. You know, we've talked about the 12 tribes of Israel. And they had, were to take these stones and they were to carry them from the river over uh, out of the river. And you actually go, they took them from where the priests were standing and they were to take them where they were staying. Now, when they went out there, they said in, in verse number, I believe it's uh, chapter four, verse five, it says, uh, each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder. Now, if you take a stone up on your shoulder, a small stone, you would just pick it up in your hand. But if you put a stone on your shoulder, that would probably be what we call today a boulder. And, these, and notice they didn't pick the leader of the tribe. They picked one from each tribe. Now, I'm just supposing, but there was probably a big guy. It was probably someone that could carry this big, heavy stone. 
And so when they took the stones out, and remember the water stopped, but when the priests came out of the water, the water went back and the river was full of flood again. And so they said, and this is where the, the title a pastor's sermon came from today. What do these stones mean? It says in verse six, to serve as a sign among you in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. This was something that God said, I'm going to make sure that you remember this because I want something physical that you can see. I mean, we go and take flowers. I go over to the VA cemetery. You, you remember all those people that did something for us because there's all those rows of those pretty white markers and everything. And there's all those pretty American flags. And today, of course, Sister Harvey has on her Memorial Day scarf. And so they, he, they did what he told them to do. They put down the stones and they did all that. And but then that chapter um, ends with us with something that people really need to know that all that was about something that when they finished doing exactly what God had, had told them to do, that he, they did that so that the people that would see that, not just them, it says so that in verse 24, he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the God of the Lord is powerful. And so that you might always fear the Lord, your God. I'm going to read that again. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. And so that you might always fear the Lord, your God. Now, we know fear is not shaking and trembling when we talk about the fear of the Lord. We're talking about respecting God, knowing who he is, knowing exactly what he's going to do. And so, of course, the title of Pastor's Sermon today was, What Do These Stones Mean? And I'm going to just briefly go over some of the things that Pastor shared with the adults. He was talking about, uh, in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And he's, that he wanted something that would be left that the people would have to teach one among many things that he had them to teach their children. And he wanted their, them to know, and they were his children, and their children to know, to know who they are and to know whose they are. They're the people that God delivered not only in that former scripture I read, there was one passage that I did not read, but he said to them, that not only did he cross them over on dry land from the Jordan, but he reminded them that he crossed them over on dry land from the Red Sea. And so God repeated the same miracle twice, taking water, moving it back, people walking on dry land so that they would be able to have a bridge to safety from their enemies. Now, this involved trusting God. Uh, if I was one of the priests and I was one of the ones carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and that's where God dwelled in, in, in ancient times, and I'm carrying the, the, the place that God's spirit comes to communicate with us human beings and in the nature of Israel, and I've got this huge responsibility, and this water is at flood level, and Joshua, the leader, tells me to take the Ark of the Covenant and step into a raging flooded river, that takes trust. And obedience and they did it and it didn't say they got in they never got into the raging river because the minute their feet touched the edge of the water just touched the water it backed up the water backed up through the power of God God's hand and we don't know because it's supernatural so I can't say what it looked like except the Bible gives a description it says the water heaped up and so the water heaped up and the amazing thing and my husband brought this up earlier pastor brought it up he said, it didn't say they walked across on the muddy land. It said they walked across on dry land. Not only did the water back up, but the ground dried out. Now that's supernatural. And so they're talking about trusting in God, training up children uh, to be obedient to God, uh, training up children to trust in God. And that's, that's what I'm hoping I'm helping your parents with. And so bas basically... Uh, the thing that really freed them from bondage, uh, it wasn't Moses, it was God. And it, God alone is the one.
who can really tr- free us from bondage. Well, you say, I'm not a slave in Egypt. Why does this matter to me? Well, we've talked about this many times. We're slaves to sin. We are in bondage. That means, you know, we're, we're in something we can't get out on our own. And sometimes we, Satan tries every day to get us to sin. Uh, little people and big people tell stories that aren't true. They're called lies. And, and, and big people and little people are told to do something and they don't do it. It's called disobedience. It's the opposite of the O word, obedience. But Satan tries to blind us to the truth. But God draws us to the truth. God knows that we're not perfect. But remember, nothing's too hard for him. Uh, matter of fact, our very survival depends on him. And let me tell you something, children, and not just children, us big people too. There is nothing wrong with acknowledging that you're weak and that you can't do it by yourself. That only God is able to help you do whatever you need to do. And then uh, in this is, was the Old Testament we were talking about in Joshua. And now and, and we're going to go to the New Testament. Pastor had scripture from 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And it's when the Apostle Paul is talking about, he has a, he calls it a thorn, a, a thorn in the flesh. Something's wrong. He never does explain exactly what it is, but he prays three times, God heal me, God heal me, you know, please, you know, I can't deal with it. And then finally, God speaks to him in his spirit, through the Holy Spirit. And God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now that's confusing. Now, we all know what grace, the word grace means. We've talked about this many times. God's unmerited favor. God doing something for you that you don't deserve. You didn't earn it, but God does it for you anyhow. And that's grace. And so God's telling Paul, uh, you know, I think you need to keep that little problem you have. Because whenever that problem bothers you, you're going to realize that you can't do this without me. And so that's why it says that when Paul is weak, God's strength is made evident because without God's strength, whatever was going on with him, he wouldn't be able to do what God called him to do without God helping him do it. And then that's back to God's power. God doesn't just move back water, rivers, and seas that we can walk on dry land. It's everyday experiences that we see God's power. Everyday experiences we see God's grace. And... um Through all this happening, uh, Christ's power, the Holy Spirit's power, what pastor says is we learn only what we do for Christ will last. There's an old song about that. Now, we learn that that, um, it's Christ's strength that helps us be spiritually strong. And the second thing he wanted us to think about today is God alone is the one with the ability to properly direct our paths and our ways. Because if we choose what we're going to do, most times we don't choose the right way. And we take the path that looks the prettiest, it looks the nicest, and maybe the smoothest. But that's not what God wants us to do. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. If you say, I think I maybe I should do this, or maybe I think I should do that. If you acknowledge God, that means you recognize God. You say, God, you know, maybe I better stop and pray about this and ask you what to do. Because sometimes in my life, I thought one way was the way to do it. And then I just felt something in my spirit was saying, no, that's not the way. And it turned out that even though it didn't seem right, the way that God told me to go ended up being correct. And then pastor went down to um, Isaiah. You know, Isaiah is a prophet, and the book of Isaiah is a book of prophecy. In Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Um, we've, we've had this verse many times, and we've talked about the fact that uh, always when we're with God, Jesus says he will never leave us or forsake us. But we can wander off. And so we need to seek him while we can still have the ability to not be so lost that we can't find our way back. And then it says that the reason we want to to look at God and the way he does it and goes down to verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor 
are your ways my ways? And we had this uh, either last week or the week before. When we do something people's way, I think last week we talked about the way, no, it was a book I was reading. It said God's ways seem upside down. I'll give you an example. If somebody slaps you, your friends will say slap them back. Jesus says turn the other cheek. And so that seems upside down. It doesn't seem right, but it is. Because Jesus says you don't hate your enemies, you love them. And so God's ways are what, when the children looked at those piles of rocks back in the, we talked about in the beginning, and their, and their parent they said, said that, that represents what God did for us. And, we're, and because that represents what God did for us, we're going to do things God's way. We're going to follow God's rules. We're not going to live like these people in this new land we came to because they came to a land where the people were unsaved, the Canaanites. And so they continued always looking back at that marker and knowing that they were supposed to do things God's way. And so in Isaiah 58, verse 11, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones now, we don't have a drought, but we have something else going on. And I talk about this every week, that we, the reason we're, we're looking at this on a video, we're not in our neat sanctuary and, and having fun, and I'm not hugging you and tickling you and having fun with you like I usually do, is because we are staying at home, making sure everybody is going to be healthy. But remember, the Lord's guiding us continually. And we're still a church, because the church is the people. We're not in the building. And so we want to remember that the Lord is still guiding us. And that the Lord will guide the grown-ups into when we can go back to the church. And the last point he got that pastor made was God alone is able to open your eyes to the truth. And remember the spirit of truth. Uh, well, I'm going to go to John 16, uh, chapter 12, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. This is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Father sent Jesus, and then Jesus came here and lived with us. And then Jesus was crucified, and he was buried, and he rose again. And then he ministered before he went back to heaven. And then he ascended, and he sent back the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one that listens to what God the Father and what Jesus says. And then he tells us. And that's what that verse is about. So we can't say that we don't know what to do. Because if we just stop a minute and pray, the Holy Spirit will speak to us. Then Pastor kind of went back to the Old Testament to one of his very favorite scriptures in Second Chronicle. Now this is a story about God coming to Solomon. And it's the night before they're going to dedicate the big temple. Because remember, David couldn't, temp couldn't build the temple because of his sin with uh, Bathsheba. Well, actually, it was his sin because he killed Bathsheba's husband. But um, he said his son could build it. So Solomon built the temple for the Lord that David wasn't allowed to. And he's going to dedicate it. And God's telling him some things to share with the people. And this is God speaking. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Children, wherever we are, if we're doing something we shouldn't do and we say we're Christian, we need to not be proud we need to pray, say we're sorry, stop doing it, and then listen to what God's saying. And then God will forgive us, and then things will turn out better. Because if we're being disobedient, God says he doesn't see us and he doesn't hear us because we cut ourselves off. And then to go back to the very end of it, when, when Moses had called Joshua... And Joshua was going to do this with the crossing of Jordan and having the people place the stones. Before Moses um, separated from the people, in Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, 
And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Now that's in the Old Testament. But we know in the New Testament that Jesus himself says that he will never leave us or forsake us. And so to sum up all this that that pastor has shared with us today and I have shared with you, it's that the hand of the Lord is on our lives and we come to know that his hand is mighty, that all power and might are in him. And we learn to fear the Lord our God forever. And then Psalms 111 verse 10 is the verse the pastor ended up with. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding. Have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. And I started out talking about the people that praised the soldiers that were their liberators. But they could only do that by guidance from God. So the one that we're always to praise And it's not just as some special day that we set aside to praise certain people. And um, I'm going to pray. And on my heart today, children, as I close, is that this year, I think if when we pray and thank God for the soldiers, like in our family, there were a lot of military. Uh, Brian, who, you know, does the videos, he was in the Air Force. His dad was in the Air Force. My Uncle Jim was in the Air Force. My Uncle Paul was in the Marines. I was in the Navy. Two of my brothers were in the Navy. Uh, we have a, a, a large, my husband's father, uh, he died from some, some uh, medical conditions from World War II. Um, we have a lot of heroes in the natural in our family. But spiritually, our true hero is God. And I want to even call out in people the people, the nurses and doctors that have taken care of people and tried to nurse them back to health that have passed because they got Corona V. But you know, God is going to, we know we live forever in the spirit. Those of them that knew God and they're now in his presence, he is rewarding them for their sacrifice. Nothing that we could do can compare to what God will do for us. If we are faithful and we are good little Christian soldiers, It won't be a a little cross and and a little flag and some flowers. It'll be eternal life with Jesus Christ. Father God, I thank you for your blessings. I thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you that you say, suffer the little children to come unto you and that all of us are your children. There are no adults of God, Father God. I know that I know I am a child of God, even in my 70s. And so I thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, lead us into obedience and lead us into wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.